the Staten Island Landfill, or Fresh Kills Landfill, was selected as the recovery operation site immediately following the terrorist attack on September 11. Initially, when we saw the towers come down, we were up on the top of Section 1 and 9, where the Trade Center uh, recovery effort is going on right now, and we were watching the, uh, the fire in the Trade Center towers. And as soon as we saw the first tower come down, I turned to my boss, Mike Mucci, and I said, we better start getting heavy equipment together because they're going to be calling for us to go over there. On September 11th, I was downtown when both the towers came down. Uh, the next day and a half I spent between the morgue and Thursday afternoon they told me to go up and see the landfill. We brought the first load in here about 2 o'clock in the morning on the 12th. When we first came here, most of the work was being done by hand. Uh, police, FBI, fire department personnel raking through the material that was being brought here. There were stockpiles all over the top of this hill. Uh, it was reaching a point where you could hardly move. Among the first challenges was to develop transfer capability. Initially everything was being trucked out here. And then it was determined that it might be best if we could get a uh, barge hauling facility built as close to the proximity of uh, the Trade Center as possible. Two new stations. Pier 25 and Pier 6, as well as an existing facility at Fort Hamilton, were utilized to transfer the debris from the trucks to the barges. Been working on this since, uh, actually, since September 11th. Uh, my office uh, actually did the dredging for Piers 25 and Pier 6. The Staten Island Landfill, or Fresh Kills Landfill, a 3,000 acre facility was closed for operations in late March of 2001 and was in the final closure process at the time of the Trade Center disaster. We still had most of our equipment operational at that point, so we could handle the material coming in and we could move it from the unloading facility up to the search facility. The debris recovery operation area spanned 175 acres on the top elevation of the site, 135 of which were employed as operation support functions, debris sorting operations, and stockpiles. The first thing I experienced up here was a surreal feeling about the environment on top of the hill as I arrived that first day. Walking through the uh, fields of debris, uh, knowing that uh, there were over two to 3,000 people who were lost in the incident. Everybody put their ego on a shelf and threw away the initials and the alphabet soup agency concept. And everybody said, look, that's what we got to do. Let's do it. I've never, seen, I've never seen equipment handed over on a handshake like this before in my life. Working on a project like this, knowing that you're a part of bringing closures to the families that lost their loved ones in this tragedy, and you sort of feel honored to be here and to work on this project. The New Jersey National Guard erected a tent compound to provide shelter for the laborers during the initial weeks of the operation. They were subsequently followed by volunteers from the Red Cross and the Salvation Army. By mid-October, fully functional support operation facilities were established. On the vacant ground of the Staten Island landfill, a self-sustaining city was constructed to provide food, shelter, electricity and health care for up to 1,200 workers 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at the peak of operation. The ground zero is just advising the government equipment, how to set their trucks up and stuff like that. And it was just a bad deal, but when we came over here, we had to try to figure out a productive way to show the evidence to the officers and try to figure out what's the best way for us to present it to them. 
We'd lay some stuff out, let them look. They might say it's too thick, too thin, whatever. We kept working at it like that till we got it basically taken care of. A daily ops meeting was conducted to facilitate management, decision making, and communication among the various agencies and contractors. A safety committee consisting of 12 city, federal, and state agencies collaborated on the development and implementation of the site health and safety plan. Regardless of agency or employer, all workers were mandated to complete the health and safety training and orientation. Upon arrival on site, each worker enters the PPE supply tent, receives a medical screening, respirator fit test and issuance, and site-specific safety orientation. What we did is sat down and brainstormed about, you know, the conditions that existed during the event uh, on 9-11 and after with respect to the fires and things like that and the combustion that took place and what might have evolved in the chemical processes uh, during that activity and came up with a list of possible contaminants that we felt it was important to test for. So I was concerned with, you know, any materials that might be in the debris, uh, perhaps asbestos, mineral wool, fiberglass, uh, metals. Our major concern here from the beginning, we've been involved since day one here at the landfill, maintaining a safe and clean operation and also providing air monitoring both for the site and for the surrounding community of Staten Island as well. Right now we're just collecting the samples, right, and then the data goes to the EPA. It runs constantly. We have it set up so that it's logging every 30 seconds. Um, it gives us the concentrated concentration and time-weighted average. It's monitoring for particulates, uh, in other words, dust. And um, this will run for the entire shift. We pick them up, uh, bring them back, and download them onto the computer, and forward the information to the proper authorities. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, under a mission assignment from FEMA, jointly managed the recovery operation with the FBI, the NYPD, and the New York Department of Sanitation. Forty city, state, and federal agencies, as well as numerous contractors and vendors, provided support to the operation. All debris from the World Trade Center must be thoroughly examined for human remains, personal belongings, and physical evidence. A 10 cubic yard O K grapple crane unloads the mixed debris and places it behind a bin wall, from which a Cat 992 loader loads 40 to 50 ton haul trucks. Debris that arrives via highway enters the Staten Island landfill through a controlled checkpoint under 24-hour NYPD command. Agency contractor and subcontractor personnel gain entrance with badges to ensure security. The trucks then traverse a gravel road to the top of the hill where they enter their designated processing area. During transit, a truck spotter inspects each load and directs the driver to the appropriate receiving area via radio communication. White pay hauler 203 is for Dan. Debris from buildings 6 and 7 is trucked and unloaded separately and segregated from other debris on site. Several federal agencies occupied these buildings and are charged with the task of identifying sensitive documents, criminal evidence, and classified materials from the debris. If we could get it back, they wanted it back, so we, we, we tried by keeping it separate. It was just a great way to segregate the material and not co-mingle it with everything else. Large metal beams are taken to a beam prep area for inspection and processing. Metal heavy loads proceed directly to the manual inspection fields, fields E and F, for stockpiling nearby. Loads heavy and fines are routed to the stockpiles adjacent to the shakers. All stockpiles are constructed in a windrow fashion to minimize rehandling. All debris is processed systematically to ensure thorough inspection. The process consists of five primary steps. 
Heavy metal scalping. Heavy metal inspection fields. Shakers. Light material inspection fields. And mechanical screening. The objective of the recovery operation is the recovery and identification of all human remains and personal belongings from the World Trade Center debris. Several large grapple excavators scalp off the heavy metal from the stockpile and cast it into the inspection field in a manner that facilitates a walk-through inspection. Federal and city agents walk through the debris field with airline and aircraft manufacturer representatives scanning for remains, evidence, and personal belongings. Once inspected, the metal debris is pushed to each end loaded and hauled to the active bank by the New York Department of Sanitation to be recycled or landfill. The remaining fines material is gathered for further processing in the Shaker area. Grapple excavators feed the stockpiled fines heavy material directly onto the Shakers. The incline vibrating shakers separate the debris into two streams. Debris six inches or larger slides off the incline deck, while smaller debris falls through the grizzly deck. A front end loader collects and transports those fragments six inches and over to the light material inspection fields, fields A and C. It is thinly spread by a front end loader prior to agent walk through inspection. Residual debris is pushed off the field by a dozer or front end loader. In between shifts, the inspection field is graded and leveled. A front end loader transfers the fine debris that falls through the shakers to stockpiles near mechanical screening machines where the debris will be examined. There are two distinct types of screening units in use, both similar in configuration. The operation has two errands and three CEC units. A hydraulic excavator with a bucket feeds the fine debris into a hopper attached to the CEC units. A front end loader feeds the errand units. Fine debris is then divided into three distinct debris streams. Debris a quarter inch or less passes through and is discarded. Debris between a quarter inch and two inches is deposited onto an inspection conveyor belt. A separate inspection conveyor belt receives fragments between two and six inches. The conveyor belts are lined with teams of agents that remove any evidence from the debris stream. Residual debris is deposited at the end of each belt, where it is removed by a front-end loader, loaded onto haul trucks, and deposited at the active bank. Prior to the implementation of the screening units in mid-October, all debris was spread onto manual fields for walk-through inspections. To ensure 24-hour operation, regardless of weather conditions, the screening units were enclosed, lighted, and heated. Evidence removed from the various debris sorting operations is divided into two broad categories, human remains and personal belongings. Recovered remains were immediately taken to the temporary morgue on site and verified as such by an anthropologist or medical examiner. They were cataloged and transferred for DNA identification to the medical examiner's office in Manhattan. 
The FBI and the NYPD first evaluate personal belongings, wallets, IDs, badges, etc. to determine the nature of the evidence. The evidence is then photographed, inventoried, and cataloged into a database to be reviewed by the next of kin. The primary mission of the recovery operation is the humanitarian effort to recover the human remains and personal belongings of those lost in the tragedy and to return them to their families. The thoughts of what I saw that day on September 11th, uh, they, they come into your mind quite a bit, uh, knowing that it could have just have easily been somebody else searching for me out there. Uh, and just trying to rebuild and trying to give solace and comfort to people who suffer. In addition to the mixed debris, approximately 1,400 cars, trucks, buses, and rescue units were damaged or destroyed in the attack. The units were hauled by truck to the auto recovery area of the landfill. An auto recovery unit used extrication devices such as the jaws of life to dismantle the vehicles in search of evidence and human remains. The vehicles, identified by number, are vacuumed and inspected on the interior, and the exteriors are power washed. The vehicles are then shredded and removed for recycling. All barges undergo a similar decommissioning process and must be cleaned of all residual World Trade Center debris. The contractor conducts screening of the residual debris by loading the material into a 10 cubic yard hopper using a bobcat. The contractor begins hosing any residual debris off walls and floors towards the bow of the barge, vacuuming water and debris concurrently. The contractor continues the rinsing and vacuuming cycle until all visible debris and water are cleared. This debris is hauled to the top of the hill, dried and inspected for evidence by the NYPD. A final inspection of the barge verifies that all World Trade Center debris has been removed prior to the transfer of the barge to a staging area where it will rejoin the Department of Sanitation system. All machinery and equipment was cleaned and decommissioned following a similar procedure. As the operational area consolidates and the fields are no longer needed, a controlled process of decommissioning takes place. The New York Department of Sanitation gathers up all residual debris and places it in a stockpile. The stockpile is transported by loader to the screening units and processed. The NYPD then does an academy march in which several agents make multiple close quarter passes searching for evidence. At the completion of this march, the field is released to the New York Department of Sanitation for final cover. The field is seeded for dust suppression and erosion control. I'd say for a job this size, it's a pretty remarkable uh, spirit of cooperation. You can talk about, you know, the mechanized equipment and streamlining the process. Uh, all of those kind of things are relatively simple. The thing that made the operation work out here is that we had people uh, with the right personalities and the right focus. In the disaster business, you have three main words that you're concerned with. Flexibility, flexibility, and flexibility. Everybody that has worked in this disaster will tell you they've been on a learning curve since day one. It wasn't a one-step process, and it was more than 12. It was an evolution of equipment, machinery, and processes that got us there. Uh, this affected every one of us. It, it, it's brought, brought us together. Well, the detectives, the FBI agents, all the other law enforcement officers that are out here in the field are working together. Uh, they're all in Tyvex, respirators and hard hats. You can't tell who the person is next to you. You only know that that person is working towards the same goal you are. 
And if you keep that same mindset when you go into an operational meeting uh, or you go into any other type of uh, large crime scene work like this, it flows so much smoother. about it like it's consecrated ground now and uh, it certainly changed our thinking about it you know it's no longer just a landfill to us and it's uh, I don't think we'll ever think of it that way again under God we pray this nation so tested and hurt this area so scarred. City of life, of business, and of love. Harbor of hope to the world's poor. City and harbor so stained by evil. Needing your help, O oh God, we pray. We pray for our dead. Give them rest eternal. Give them unending joy. Give them someday us. For these, your workers from New York, New Jersey, from Carolina and Alabama, from throughout your land. For these, your workers from government and private sector, from churches and charities. For these who came to Fresh Kills, to Ground Zero, who labored long, hard, reverently, to bring some peace to forever broken hearts. Give these laborers and menders of hearts your healing grace. Turn this fury, O oh God, into works of peace. Give us zeal, O oh God, to rebuild our own ruined walls of Jerusalem, to build cities in a world of justice where this happens no more. And give us, God, firm resolve that our beautiful dead now buried or whose ashes forever grace our winds, may never soar or rest forgotten. Finally, God, as grass grows green again on fresh kills, teach us that life, not death, has triumphed, and love, not hate, is our path from here. Bless us forever in your holy name. Under God we pray, amen.